Your ears do not deceive you. You have just entered the Cryptid Creator Corner brought to you by your friends at Comic Book Yeti. So without further ado, let's get on to the interview. Hey, comics fam. I wanted to tell you about this amazing new Kickstarter project funding soon from my friend David Rodriguez. It follows the adventures of three young heroes chosen by mystical gems of power and trained in a secret program called Guardian Battle Force Mexico. The world's first Aztec Super Sentai control three unique guardian spirits, the jaguar, the hummingbird, and the unicorn to defend the children from an ancient evil that haunts their nightmares. I got an advanced look at this and it blew me away. Artist Stefano Simeone is top-level talent having worked on Mega Man, Radiant Black, and Star Wars, among other things. And this is a perfect fit for a story that has something of a cross between so many of the team-oriented 80s cartoons I love. I interviewed David a couple years ago for his graphic novel, Finding Gossamer, and I've been looking forward to seeing what he does next. This has the look of something that will definitely get picked up by a major publisher, so get in on the ground floor. Head over to Kickstarter and search for Battle Mex to sign up for notifications when this thing goes live. I've also dropped a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. It will be available in both English and Spanish, which I absolutely love. This podcast has always been about promoting diversity and inclusion in comics, and it makes it so much more accessible to a wider community of new, younger readers. Don't miss it. This is Byron O'Neill, your host for today's episode of the Cryptic Creator Corner. Today, I'm joined by someone who, if his name doesn't immediately leap to mind, I damn near guarantee you've read something he's worked on. For over 15 years, he has helped shape the voices and vision of what is arguably the most recognized comics imprint of all time, DC's Vertigo, until he transitioned to working as a freelance editor for Image, Comixology, DC, First Second Books, and TKO, to name a few. He's worked with the biggest heavy hitters in the business for two decades and is now turning his attention to helping launch the new comics publishing company, Distillery, as its founding editor. Will Dennis, thanks for joining me on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for that intro. Not too bad. I hope. Pretty, pretty impressive, I know, I have to say. <laughs> Good. <laughs> That's what we're going for. Um, yeah. well, I've gotten in the habit of checking to see, you know, now who the editor is on, on everything I pick up. And and your name keeps popping up. I'm going back and, and filling in some gaps um, from back when. So most recently, that was Greek Street, which I got to say, it oh. was pretty excellent. Yeah. Whoa. That's a blast from the past. Peter Milligan, the most underrated comic book writer of the last... 35 years probably yeah his stuff's yeah. his stuff's great that was a huge swing um i really really enjoyed it conceptually um i was like why didn't they make a tv series about this but i guess that was before the big ip grab yeah and, and you know i mean the vertigo being part of warner brothers at the time yeah i mean you could ask that about so much of the stuff it's like you know where are the shows for 100 bullets a lot of other stuff that seems pretty obviously translatable but yeah, those wheels ground pretty slow, particularly in those days. But yeah, that would that, yeah, that, I haven't heard that one in a while. I mean, Peter, I'd love Peter's work for like years and years and years, and then finally had reached out to him to be like, "Hey, do you want to you know try to do some stuff?" And he pitched a bunch of things. We I didn't think we ended up doing two or three things right in a row. There, there was a one called the Names, and then there was another one that they ended up finishing. I think at Image or something that um, was kind of towards the end of my run at vertigo but um yeah greek street was a great one definitely yeah, yeah. i enjoyed that cool. one. well yeah Thank let's you. let's jump into distillery um there's not too much coverage out there right now which is you know part of why i wanted to, to have you on for a chat you know there's uh, some comicsology roots with david steinberger and chip Mosier, kind of mm-hmm. having pivotal roles as, as ceo and cco respectively and okay so you'll have to forgive me here but i've been reading comics since 1979 and and we've both seen you know, a lot of new publishing companies enter and exit the scene. Mm-hmm. So, so what was missing in the medium that led to the idea that kind of would become distillery? Um, you know, I think it's this combination of a lot of stuff. One, it's, it's like where we all were at in our careers in terms of the work that we've done, the people that we knew, you know, the, the people we thought we could bring on board. Um, there was this sort of combination of somebody who really, intimately knows the digital space and basically created like the digital reading experience as most people know it you know in yeah. david's work at comiXology and you know all that stuff and then you have but then you also have this push on the other side to create these kind of you know artifacts like oh i mean it sounds that sounds kind of hokey but you know what i mean like comics that like of a higher 
quality, bigger size, something different format wise, something that would sort of feed into, you know, a lot of the collectible, you know, stuff that came has, you know, really in the recent years kind of, you know, reinvigorated a lot of the industry and for good or bad, some of it, you know? Um, yeah. And it was just that sort of thing. Like, can, can you, and then can you get creators of the certain quality, but can you also then give them participation in the company and ownership of their IP? And there isn't a lot of that, you know, the monkey business. I mean, even being at a place like Vertigo, I mean, it was tech, you know, it was creator owned as much as it could be. And like, basically the Vertigo contract is the same contract that all these other smaller publishers have, you know, copied over the years, you know, yeah. um, in terms of it being like a shared ownership and that sort of thing. And so, um, so it's not quite as creator owned as like an image is where they don't, you know, take any kind of interest or stake in the IP um, beyond the, the publishing stuff, you know, obviously. But um, so, yeah, I was like trying to figure out like what what's the sweet spot there, like, you know, where you can you're taking a risk as a publisher. So you, you want a certain amount of participation, but you also don't want to be dissuading people because for a long time, particularly towards my end of run at Vertigo, that was the big that was the hardest thing for us to overcome, right? Like once image in the early, you know, like maybe 2010, 11, 12 started to really pick up steam and we couldn't really compete with that at vertigo in terms of, you know, well, we're doing the same kind of projects, these cool genre creator own things, but they don't, they don't want any stake or they don't take any stake in the media stuff, you know? Right. So that was the deal breaker on so many things. I mean, I definitely, there's a number of projects, that ended up an image that, you know, were on my desk originally. And then, you know, like you just couldn't get it sorted out because, you know, why they didn't right. want to have to share anything with DC or Vertigo, which, you know, sure. is fine. If you have an alternative, then, yeah. you know, I totally support that. You know? yeah. So, yeah. I mean, so I think distillery, it was to try to figure out like all of those moving parts, you know, that would sort of something that collectors and the, the print industry would like and, but also this digital, you know, trying to figure out is this digital comic reading experience and, but also like this digital marketplace, you know, and then right. um, trying to treat people in a certain way, creators, fair, you know, in a certain way, a fair, uh, like a, with the equity stakes and all the rest of it that they have. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's like a work in progress, obviously, but, you know, so far, it feels like so far so good. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really, I think, novel foundational approach that I haven't seen before, uh, which kind mm -hmm. of hopefully will insulate the company from some of the pitfalls of, you know, navigating the indie comics publishing space. Um, Cause you brought down the expertise from all these very entertainment fields. You know, you have a movie producer, a video game executive, mm -hmm. tech strategist, mm -hmm. even a media giant with Kodansha, you know, like, which right. sort of blew my mind. Cause I saw them on a premier league dasher recently. So mm -hmm. like, that's, that's, that's a big deal to have that much reach. Um, so I know you've been doing sure. you know, all that, that, that freelance work for Comixology. Um, so you've got that established connection. Was it in bringing you on board? Was it as simple as like, Hey, Will, we've got this new thing. You want to jump in? Yeah. I mean, pretty much. I mean, I think it's okay. like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, my philosophy has always been like, if I hire really good people, then, you know, makes my job a lot easier. It makes my life yeah. a lot easier in general, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, it comes with its own issues at times. If you're working with people at a certain, you know, part of the food chain or whatever, you know, the approach is different, but, um, but yeah, if you hire really good people to do their stuff, like I don't need to be meddling in the thing. And I think David and Chip definitely sort of share the same philosophy. It's like, they know, I mean, Chip is great at the promotional stuff and dealing with the retailers and kind of having his finger on also a lot of that sort of thing and then david is you know as you say like more of the tech kind of entrepreneur you know fundraising understanding how to you know raise money and get it from all these different pots and different different parts of different industries that you know you may end up leaning on or leveraging later for stuff and so but that kind of leaves out the editorial you know side so it's like all right well then why don't we just go find the person that we really trust who has a track record and works with all the people that we kind of admire and a lot of the people that we're bringing in. So yeah, it seemed like a real obvious fit, you know? Yeah. So what does your role look like on kind of a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah, it's a little, it's a little, um, 
there were some issues like not issues, but like trying to define it. Cause I'm not the editor in chief. Right. So, you know, and that was a bit by choice on my part, I think, you know, um, just meaning that I could still keep like a lot of the other freelance stuff that I've been doing. Yeah. Keep it, you know, like I'm not exclusive to distillery per se, you know, right. I still have, I don't know, probably a half a dozen or more books at the moment at, um, you know, at image at other places, still finishing up stuff at comiXology doing you know bits and bobs for other smaller companies here and there yeah so in that respect like i'm not really operating as an editor-in-chief like i it's more of a consultant role kind of on on the bigger picture side and then you know but then i'm attached individually to certain projects right so like gone the jock book or somna the becky clunan and lisa you know tula lote book that we're just wrapping up now and you know, I think they've announced some of the other ones like the White Boat, the Scott Snyder, Francesco, Francavia book and Blood Brothers Mother. That's Riso and Azarello, who I worked yeah. with for years on 100 Bullets. So, yeah, I'm working with them individually on those projects in just the same traditional kind of editorial way that I normally would. But then okay. I also, yeah, I mean, David and Chip and the rest of the team there, like I have a lot of input or help on you know, whatever sort of stuff, like either is it people that they're talking to? Is it, you know, previews stuff? Is it marketing kind of stuff? Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I try not to, like, I try to stay in my own lane as much as I can, you know, I mean, yeah. I feel like they've done a great job of hiring, you know, people who do social media, people who do kind of the marketing and people who do the production. Like I, I'm not, I've had a lot of success in my career taking over projects from other people. You know, like 100 Bullets or Why the Last Man were books that I inherited, essentially. And I think the smart thing that I did was kind of understanding what I was good at and then not feeling the need to put my fingerprints all over every single thing. Yeah. Which is not, you can't say that of a lot of, you know, necessarily all the people, other editors that I've worked with over the years, other, you know, there there is a tendency, you know, you see it all the time. You see it in sports, you see it in entertainment, you know you hire a new person in and then suddenly they got to like, everything's got to change. They got to have their fingerprint, you know, like I definitely do not subscribe to that as a philosophy. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, I I'm not going to get in there and just be like, you know, you should be doing the TikTok videos this way. Cause I don't know anything about making TikTok videos, but I do know a lot about making like kind of high quality cool genre comics that hopefully will, you know, stand the test of time. <laughs> Well, so yeah has... so it's, it's an interesting role you know like i don't even other projects and other people like they might talk to me about oh we're talking to so-and-so but they're you know or they may even send me pitches you know they might be getting in from new writers and stuff but like say for instance like something like blasphemous which just premiered from mirka and dolfo like they're not sending me the scripts for that you know like yeah. i'm not reading the scripts i'm not seeing the stuff i may see this i mean they, they do a nice job of um trying to create almost the vibe of like a virtual studio, you know, like there's, there's WhatsApp threads and other kind of communication stuff with everybody who's in the company, you know, yeah. um, creatively and internally. And so there's a lot of sharing of, you know, oh, this thing just came in, you know, this, this cover just came in or this press release is going to go out or that, you know, that kind of stuff. So at least you get to feel everybody feel, you know, cause being freelancers is very isolating, right? Like they're very kind of off yeah. on an Island. Yeah. Um, so they have done a great job, I think, of trying to at least keep people in a loop and there's a lot of chat, you know, chatter, um, back and forth. And some people don't participate at all. And some people have to participate a lot, you know, but it's, it is kind of a nice little, um, it's nice to have these outlooks for people to sort of see stuff. But anyway, long story short, like I'm not, I don't like, I'm not approving everything that goes, you know, out the door, so to speak, you know, yeah. but. It's okay. kind of an interesting I mean, like little spot to be in there, you know. Yeah, it feels very fluid. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah. So I, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, Greg Lockhart is working as he's doing some editing stuff too. Um, um, that... Yeah, I mean, he helped me on the Devil's Cut for sure. Okay, I, he might be. He he works a lot with James on his stuff for Image and and like his his uh, Substack and everything. Yeah. So I don't. I he may be you know doing some of that. Um, you know, and working on some of the books with James, like I'm not working on any of James's, you know, James's books. Like he's got his whole tiny onion empire that, you know, sort of like they're 
packaging and bringing it all in kind of that way. So yeah, I assume Greg is and other people like that, you know? Yeah. Is there, is there an ethos, like an over, you know, overarching one that like that, that you're kind of bringing in, but I, 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 to some extent, I'm just kind of hearing you, 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 you take an air traffic control for, for lack mm-hmm. of a better way mm-hmm. of putting it mm-hmm. kind of, kind of role where you, you let the people that you hire that are good, you hire the right people, you let them do their gig. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, are you, is there, is there an, Im, are you imparting, you know, kind of any imprint into the, you feel like into the DNA or is it just a, okay, I'm trying to make and put out the best product, you know, mm-hmm. here. And, mm-hmm. and that's my role. Yeah. I mean, I think that's always been my role. It's kind of, I mean, the real thing, the success I've had, I feel like is mostly based around, um, it's communication skills. It's like my interpersonal skills, but it's also knowing what people need. Right. You know, it's like that everyone's different. I mean, one of the mistakes a lot of companies make, um, a lot of, you know, places like a lot of editorial and I'll say, you know, Marvel editorial, DC editorial, you know, those sorts of things. And they were making it while I was still there. And I think they're still making a lot of these mistakes and you can see it in the end product really, um, is that, you know, when the only tool you have is a hammer, like everything looks like a nail, right. You know, so it's just like, you're trying, and we used to have this fight at DC all the time, like even the marketing and salespeople, like, you know, selling Batman versus selling Greek street, like they're two very different things, but you know, there was one department, there was one group of people, there was one sales team, you know, and I used to have huge fights with like, can we just, can we sit with these people? Can we come up with like talking points? Can we just meet the handful of retailers that we know are buying all of this kind of mature creator owned stuff? They're not the same ones who are buying 500 copies of Teen Titans, you know? So yeah. it was like trying to find that. So I feel like, you know, that's been a fight for me forever that I've been having and, you know, much less so at distillery, obviously, but because they really kind of understand, you know, even within the company, the different books are selling to different audiences. They're selling to different retailers. They're being selling them in different ways, you know, that sort of stuff. But, but yeah, even editorially speaking, it's like, for me, it's just been like knowing, you know, knowing what the person needs and try to helping them with that. You know, some people really want, like a lot of input and a lot of back and forth and a lot of, you know, and there's a lot of hair pulling and sort of, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, someone like a Scott Snyder, like Scott is, you know, he's doing like work at a super high level and he's like, you know, top of the food chain and everything, but you know, he's definitely, and he's been doing it now a long time, but he's still like, he likes a lot of back and forth. He likes a lot of, you know, getting on the phone and talking it over and and he's just talking and I'm just listening kind of stuff. Whereas, you know, I can work with, guys like a Jeff Lemire or, you know, even like Azarello, like they're just sending stuff in, you know, and then I, and it's fully done and, you know, we might have a current conversation. We might not, you know, it's just like, I mean, you know, we'll have a conversation, but like, you know, there's not a lot of, I mean, by the time you get it, it seems very fully formed and there's not, they're not looking for a ton of input and they're right. not looking for a ton of feedback necessarily, you know, they're not, they're not opposed to it. But it's also, you know, it's just a different thing, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's true of artists too. You know, there's artists that want to send stuff in. You want to go through every page or panel, and then there's other people that, like, you get the sense that they don't really need that or want that. And then it's like trying to, you know, you, that doesn't mean you're not making changes or asking for stuff. Like, I'm always willing to ask like anybody for something if I feel it's necessary. But, um, but even that, you know, I, I. I try to limit that kind of stuff as much as I can, you know, I mean, my own ethos in that respect is just kind of always, always this arbitrage of like, what is getting, what is asking for this change get me versus what is asking for this change lose me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't think a lot, I don't, I've known a lot of editors and worked with a lot of editors over the years. And I don't think that's universal, you know, I I think that there's a, there's, there's a philosophy that definitely exists that if I'm not asking for changes, then I'm not doing my job, you know, um, which is fair, you know, and if that's the way you want it, but I've never really subscribed to that. Like I've never approached it that way. And at which I think then is reflected, you know, egotistically or whatever in the relationships that I've maintained over the years, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, that I'm still working with people that I've worked with for 20 some years and working at a really high level and they're still doing 
what I think is their best work, you know, for me or with me. Maybe even it's that it's even saying like doing it with me as opposed to for me, you know, sort of thing. Um, yeah. Which I think a lot of editors fall into this trap of, you know, that that's what editing is. It's asking for changes. It's, you know, it's, you know, putting your fingerprints on stuff. It's, you know, in a lot of cases, sadly, it's like putting your boot on somebody's neck to get them to do it, you know, or threatening them or firing them. I mean, I can count on one hand the people I've fired in my whole career. And in, nine times out of 10 and I don't even think there's been 10 people I've had people come to me years later and be like you know what like that was the right thing to do like I wasn't I wasn't ready or I was messing it up or I you know like I would have fired me too kind of like I've had that conversation over the years you know sure um yeah where I think a lot of other editors in different positions in different places like that's their go-to you know yeah. move is like yeah, I'm gonna replace you or there's someone else that can do it like uh, you know I don't, I don't think fear is generally a great motivator for like creative endeavors, you know? <laughs> Certainly not when you're trying to make a career out of doing what you're doing. Yeah. Like, you don't you don't want to be the ax man and that's your reputation. That's, that is not a. Yeah, you know, no. Nice right. Or just the person that's constantly, you know, like the churn and you see it. I mean, if you go look at other kinds of editors who have been doing it a long time, you know, they, they might maintain certain relationships, but you know, it doesn't necessarily they go through these phases where they're working with a handful of people and then they're working with a new handful of people. And you start to realize like, Oh, that last handful of people, like just didn't have enough. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, so. we're in, um, we're in a bit of a comics Renaissance right now. Um, and, and, but I feel a lot of, you know, apprehension, um, uh, in the comics creative community. There's, I guess there's a lot of doubt as, as to where the wind industry is headed. So, <clears throat> Kind of, in your opinion, as an industry veteran, um, you know, how do how do we write the ship? How do we how do we build that foundation um, and, and move forward? I guess and and make people feel a little bit more positive about things. Um, yeah, I mean that's a good question. I, I don't. I wish I had a good answer. I mean, some of it I don't really is a little baffling to me from the standpoint of it's a bit even like the greater culture, particularly in the United States, where it's like there's this sort of sense of you know, gloom and sort of things. But when you look at a lot of the traditional indicators of where things would be positive, you know, whether it's with like jobs, you know, the, the employment rates or inflation coming down or other things like that, like it, we should be in a more positive mind state, like on a traditional basis, it feels like than we are. And the same with comics in a lot of ways, it's sort of like, there's all this great material and there's been this like Renaissance and all this incredible stuff. Yet the storyline still tends to be, oh, you know, like it's terrible where it's, everyone's going out of business, the sales are down, you know, all these sorts of things. And it's like, and if you really drill down into a lot of the numbers and stuff, like that's not necessarily the case. And I don't, I don't, but I don't know how you turn like the mood of everything, you know, around, you know, um, because there's a, like a sort of an intellectual side to that. But then there's also like an emotional side to that. So, I mean, the only thing I would say about it, and and I, you know, I think I've probably told the story before in other places, but comics and I think comics specifically, in my experience, like based on other places and other industries I've worked in, we do have this propensity for like the sky is falling, kind of, yeah. you know, like like kind of uh, like I think people have been predicting the death of comics since the first person drew a comic, probably, you know. I mean, yeah. even to the fact like so, I started. I started in Vertigo in October of 1999 and I had been working in the film industry in New York city for like six or seven years before that. Um, okay. Maybe not quite that long, five or six years and making like a lot of money and you know, it's film. So everything is amped up, but it was also horrible, right? It, like people were horrible. The industry was, I mean, it was an exciting time. It was the nineties. It was like independent films blowing up at Sundance and everybody's, you know, going from rags to riches overnight. And, you know, but like it wasn't a pleasant place to work, you know, just in terms of the way people treated each other. And um, so, when, but so when I went to work at DC in October, I took a huge pay cut, like maybe I don't know, seventy five percent pay cut or something, like something really significant. Um, yeah. But it was just like I loved comics and I loved comics my whole life, and it felt like something that I could, you know, maybe be good at in a career. 
But literally two weeks after I started in DC, they had this all hands meeting and Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn, who was then the president, like stood up and basically read off this list of, you know, here's all the books that are getting canceled. Here's all the stuff. We don't know how long we're going to be able to continue at this rate. We don't know any of this. And it was like, Oh my God. Like, I don't, can I, I don't know if I can swear on your podcast, but you you know, it was just like, you know, it was just like what I went home and talked to my wife and sitting at the kitchen table. And I was like, what the hell, you know, did I just do? And she's saying to me like, yeah, what the hell did you do? You know? And it was just like the worst thing you could imagine, you know, to hear. And I'm looking, I come out of the meeting looking at Karen Berger and Shelly Bond and stuff who'd hired me and being like, you know, like, what did you guys let me walk into here? You know, and that was in October of 1999, you know? So it's like, here we are, like literally 25 years later and we're sort of all freaking out about, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen, you know? Um, So I don't know. So I I, I wish I had the answer for, for why people feel this way but i also you have to there is this like i don't know maybe this time it's different right i mean but but everybody thinks that always you know i mean there's 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 uh you know they found graffiti on ancient mesopotamian ruins that say you know kids these days have it so easy you know they don't understand how hard it was for me you know so it's like some of this stuff is you know it's always been that but but yeah, because I think if you really look at the good stuff that's happening, I mean, there is so much more opportunity for people, um, people that traditionally haven't had opportunities, I think, you know, finding more space for opportunities, you know, there's more, even I say this to people when they're talking about breaking into the industry, it's like, when I first started, I mean, it really, you really did have to kind of convince Vertigo or DC or Marvel to hire you to be in the industry. Right. Even though there were small publishers, you know, at the time, Dark Horse, Image, other places like that, like it still felt like, you know, you had to kind of have gatekeepers like myself included anoint you that you were in the industry. But it's yeah. like you, you don't really need that anymore. You know, it's like, you know, you have an idea and you have people and you know somebody who can draw it and you can raise the funds on Kickstarter and do it like, hooray, you're in the industry, you know, welcome aboard, you know. So it's like you know there, there's that sense of like when everything is so flattened out and horizontal now that it's um some of those old mindsets still persist i'm always surprised when i meet people at shows and they ask about and they're doing 10 different weird things and then they're talking to me about how do i break in i'm like you're in like i don't know what do you want me to say you know like i mean if you're talking about how do you get a job at marvel or dc well yeah i mean that's a different argument a different discussion but some of it is just this there is this very weird, pervasive, like imposter syndrome, lack of yeah. self confidence, lack of, and that permeates the entire industry. It's not even just the people within it; it's the way we even look at comics and the way we've traditionally looked at comics, and you know that we're the sort of redheaded stepchild of, you know, publishing and everything. You know that, and it's it certainly changed in the years that I've been in the business. It's gotten a lot more. Um, it's certainly gotten a lot more mainstream, obviously, you know, with the rise of TV and movies and everything. But yeah, there was definitely a time early on in my career when people would ask me what I would do. And it was like, I work in publishing, you know, and it was just this weird sort of, you know, you had this tick almost of like not not saying that you edited comic books or something, which seems, I mean, it seems embarrassing, it's kind of stupid in hindsight, but, you know, it is, it is sort of, a, it is very like in the DNA of our industry that we have this, you know, kind of lack of self-esteem almost, you know, for yeah, better yeah. Or worse. Yeah. I mean, that's societally pervasive. I mean, I remember from the music industry, I try to tell people what I do and they're like, okay, what, what? And you say roadie and immediately they, they get it. But at the same time, it, it, it calls to mind so many of these other, you know, preconceived right. things about it. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah, no, I had no idea when you said you worked in the music industry, and then when you say you're a roadie, like in my own mind, it's like, oh wait, those are two totally different things. Exactly, <laughs> Which exactly. Is not, not fair at all, and it's like, and I know from my own experience, like you say, like yeah, what what a comic book editor does, or at least what I think they do, versus what you know, probably people, you know, I always have people like, oh, so you correct the the typos and the you know the grammar and stuff, but I'm like, well, yeah, but that's you know two percent of what I do, you know. It's, yeah, it's not you know not really the bulk of it, but well, yeah, I mean, 
I spent like 15 years um, really working with, with, you know, the biggest names in music, you know, and all these varied roles, stage manager, production manager, down to like the guy driving the catering truck at times when my leg was broken, you know, and and I'm kind of curious about parallels between that and what you do, you know, music, I I found anyway, that that the big thing was, was putting the work first. um, And then Mm -hmm. frankly, just having the balls to tell famous people what to do when, when, when it came to that. Um, and I, I'm kind right. of assuming comics people are better behaved um, than, than musicians, sure. but that's a low bar. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, I've spoken, yeah. spoken to a few editors at bigger publishing companies, and it, it, and it seems like that you know that and you were talking about the management styles are, are are very different. It feels like than comics, but you know, how do you how do you do that? How do you keep the the big guns in line, or is it just a matter of okay, Brian? Brian doesn't want that much, whereas I know I need to uh, communicate daily with Scott. Let's just say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you you are right. I mean, we jokingly had this adage for years that there there are no comic book rock stars. You know, I mean, I used yeah. I used to say to people all the time, "There's no such thing as a comic book rock star, and there's no such thing as a comic book emergency." You know, like when people when either when people would start to get a little too big for their britches. Or when people are really starting to lose their shit over, you know, oh my God, this book, it's got this, and that, and it's like, listen, you know, we're not, this is not the ER, we're not curing cancer here. Yeah. Like, yeah, we want the books to come out, we need them to come out, it's commercial publishing, you got to ship it at some point. But yeah, at a certain point, like, let's, like, everybody calm down, you know, like, the, like we're good, like, we'll, we'll fix this, it's, it's fixable, whatever. Yeah, and it's the same with the rock star thing. I mean, yeah. Probably who's the closest to a rock star we have? Neil Gaiman, maybe, you know? I mean, it's right. like, it's a weird thing in industry. Like, the higher up the food chain you go, like a Jim Lee, right? Like, Jim Lee should be, like, the Mick Jagger of comics in terms of just he's been around, he's done everything, he's, like, the man, you know? And, but if you meet, like, he's the night. I mean, yeah, he's a businessman. He can be cutthroat. He can be very, you know, whatever, I'm sure. But he's also, like, the nicest, like, most chilled out, friendly sort of person and he never like i've gone hung out with him when i have guys who are doing mini comics that you know they print like in their basement along with you know dave gibbons and brian Azarello and frank miller or whoever and it's like they all get treated kind of the same you know what i mean yeah. like there isn't there really isn't a lot of huge egos in the industry um and you know the people like for myself the people i have come across that want to operate like that like it's generally like one off you know and then i'm like i don't want who wants to deal with that stuff you know i mean you meet a guy like jock who's like does it all now he's writing drawing doing all this stuff like you're not going to meet a nicer warmer more fun kind of just you know welcoming kind of person than that you know which is not true of like say the film industry and i'm sure oh my god the music industry you know 100 percent, yeah yeah. So, I mean, which was a huge change for me when I came over. I mean, I remember I showed up the first day to work in a suit and people would just like mock me at DC. <laughs> they were like, yeah, don't, they're like, lose the suit. Like no one wears suits. And I was expecting a lot more of that kind of the yelling or the demanding stuff. And, you know, um, I really, by and large, has been very limited, you know, in my experience um, yeah. over the years. But yeah, I mean, I, I had the benefit at the moment anyway of having put in so much time with all these people that um i don't really you know i don't have awkwardness about like you know asking for stuff or asking for changes and that sort of thing but i I can't really say that i ever have as because as i said like there's really so few people that people that you feel like you have to you know defer to or worry about what they you know their expectation or worry about you know Oh, they're handlers. Like, no, I mean, even in comics, like the funniest thing, like, I mean, I've always said this for years personally, like, I think my biggest skill is the kind of managing of the talent. So if there were more money in the business, like that's what I would do, right? Like I would probably just stop, um, you know, cause the daily grind of editing comics can really kind of wear on you. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, yeah. I feel lucky that I have the job, but the, you know, the, 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 the trafficking the pages and the you know the ad, the reading the stuff and getting it here and hitting the dead you know like if i could just kind of help creators you know with their ideas and manage their schedules and kind of pick and choose their projects better or that sort of stuff you know yeah. like what would like a manager like a business manager music manager kind of thing would do um 
I think I'd be really much, uh, I, you know, that would really like lean into my skill set, you know, identifying new talent, breaking new talent, that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, there just generally isn't like enough, you know, money. Like, you know, you're not talking about these million dollar contracts that you could take like a 10% share of and, you know, live comfortably off it kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, but because I, I do think, I mean, I think a lot of people in the industry would benefit from that for sure, you know, because I do find there's a lot of people that have a hard time um, juggling all the stuff, all the commitments, getting the work done, but then also just navigating the waters of, you know, kind of, okay, I'm going to do this project, but this is going to be the one that I leverage to do this or, you know, whatever. Like I, I see, I see so many people kind of, you know, staying kind of where they are and not advancing or they plateau at a certain point, you know, and it's like they're, they're, but it's like they kind of making the same mistakes over and over or just repeating the same work over and over and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like, and I, I feel like they, they probably could use somebody to just like a little bit of a guiding hand or someone's even to kind of give advice to, you know, but which yeah. I do, you know, I feel like at this point I've earned the, the respect of like my peers that they, listen to me when I'm giving that kind of advice, you know? Yeah, 100%. All right, let's take a quick break. What in the Sam Hill is happening right now? What is that? Yeah, what you know? You like bards? Yeah, what you know? Oh, you like band of bards. It's not my fault, you mumble. Oh, what you know? That makes sense. They're dropping some great new series right now. There's that one about a heavy metal guitarist in the 1970s with monsters, working class wizards. You know how we love monsters around here. And my friend Dakota Brown, he's working on a project, uh, Grandma Tilly's Hell Tech Mech with Lane Lloyd. I saw the preview for that. That is crazy. Jimmy even contributed to their anthology from the static and had Matt Sumo on the podcast to talk about his project, The Bardic Verses, which... Makes a lot of sense that the project landed there. Yeah, where are you uh, blah, blah, blah. Where can you find them? You need to get out more. They are in previews, or you can visit their website, bandabars.com, for all the latest. Can we turn the music off now? <laughs> Thank you. No more surprises, minstrels, or anything like that, or I'll rent you out to the Ren Fair as a children's ride. <laughs> Let's get back to the show. I am curious so. about, with respect to distillery, um, mm-hmm. Because right now, you know, it's big boys, girls, and and non-binary folks um, who are, you know, who are up to the plate, if you will. And that makes perfect sense. I mean, as mm-hmm. as a new publisher and stuff. Um, but I'm trying to get a feel for future, right? And is is the design to kind of keep the the top people, or is is it going to be more of a thing where you're trying to break in some some mm-hmm. new stuff amount, you know, over time? I'm just mm-hmm. kind of longitudinally i'm trying to get an idea of what yeah um yeah definitely more the latter for sure i mean okay. you know the idea that you kind of you're establishing you know expectations you're you know meeting whatever kind of commitments we've made to investors and everything else you know i mean and starting off with the biggest talents you can get and the biggest names you can get you know certainly from a sales standpoint you know is certainly helpful there so I mean, that's the early stage plans, but yeah, long term, there's definitely a sense of, um, I think one of the things that we've recognized or I've recognized over the years, and Mark Doyle, my old associate at DC, you know, runs IDW and stuff. He had talked for years and really smartly. So like, you know, industries like in the hip hop, you know, rap and, you know, that kind of music industry, there's definitely that kind of mentor sort of bringing people along kind of thing that happens a lot, right? Like you bring yeah. in somebody to do a, you know, like sing the hook on your song and then you're, you know, then you're producing their album. And then, you know, just the fact that you put them on your record, then that's sort of, you know, saying to the audience, like, Hey, this person's like legit. I don't think comics has done a great job of that sort of thing. I mean, I, you do see it in certain, you know, little clicks and things, but yeah, that was definitely, you know, part of like the conversations early on just about like what, you know, once this initial batch of like heavy hitters kind of gets their turn at the plate, it only makes sense that you're going to then start casting a net that's a little wider. But then also I think, you know, uh, you know, the sense of like an incubator kind of thing, you know what I mean? Like where you're going to, 
not just, you know, I, I broke a lot of new talent at DC. Like if you go back and look at Vertigo over the years, like the people that I, you know, gave kind of their first significant work to, whether it was like someone like Jock or Jason Aaron or other people like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there was also though, you're sort of at a certain point, like they just kind of left them to sink or swim, you know? I mean, not that I wasn't there to help them if they needed help, but you know, at least the way the industry, particularly companies like Marvel and DC, it's like, well, then you're just dealing with other editors or in different departments. Like you kind of sink or swim, you know, based on that sort of thing. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think something where we're, you know, bringing stuff in, bringing new people in, new ideas in, but also, um, you know, really, again, like helping them kind of navigate, you know, all the waters here and, and whatever. But I think, you know, by establishing certain expectations, sales, things, early on like you know you have to have that foundation before you can really start to take flyers on on a lot of other you know i mean it's hard enough to get retailers and stuff on board with you know all this sort of a-listers you know so it's like yeah to turn around and be like oh yeah we have this 9.99 book from a whole team of people you never heard of <laughs> you know like your reputation will carry a certain amount of weight but it only will get you so far you know i mean at a certain point it's like a cash flow is super people right so yeah. um but yeah i mean i think is any long-term public any publisher that would be hoping to be around for a long time as these guys do i mean it has to be sort of part of your plan right you know i mean you have to and i and i feel like at least for me personally and I, I think that they share the same feeling it's like you 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 kind of owe it like i've had an amazing run i've had an amazing life as a result i've met like incredible people you know i've done more traveled more than than i would have ever dreamt of you know taking this job that i've got so it's like i feel like at a certain point like you've got to go back and you know try to you know i I don't know what the like without sounding totally corny about it like there has to be an aspect of your career or a certain amount of time you set aside in your day that you're giving some of that back to somebody right like you have to be trying to find some it's not all just sales and profits and all the rest of that kind of stuff you know you have to sort of take on a more mentoring role and i think you have to start to move aside to let other people in right you know i mean i think that's i mean we used to joke at dc like the only way to get promoted at dc was if somebody died basically you know like it was the only way you know which is a testament to it is a cool job and people did love the jobs and everybody who's in these jobs does it a huge part of it is because you love it you know the medium and the in the industry you know not for the money like there's very you know i don't know anybody that got into comics for the money you know so to speak so it's like um yeah so i think a part of that too is like you have to be prepared or should be prepared or hope moving yourself into a position where you're opening that door for newer people right you know like i think if you're going to evolve and change like it can't just be the same people you know like i still think of myself as kind of it's, you know, you still feel like you've kind of young or you would the way you'd look at older established people when you first started. But like, I've been that person now for a long time, even though if I don't feel that way myself. So it's like, you know, you kind of owe it to the next group of people that, you know, you're going to try to, you know, maybe make it a little easier for them or open a door for them or, you know, or even just get out of the way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, yeah. is there a is there a throttle control for you? You know, at this point in your life, you know, is, is there you know a personal threshold of like, okay, now I'm I'm taking on too many things, if you will. Um. Yeah, and it's only been recently though that I've sort of been even trying to deal with that. I mean, one of the biggest heart things for me going to be a, I mean, I, I I almost wish that like, I wish there was like a work exchange program, you know, that like when freelancers could come and work in the offices for a month and then you could go freelance for a month. Like when I was at Vertigo, like once I, when I first left Vertigo, I was wishing that we'd had some kind of a work trade thing where, you know, I could have got a sense of what it was like to be a freelancer for even a week or something, you know, versus their expectation of what it was like. The amount of stuff that they never saw that I had to do and deal with on a daily basis at a place like Vertigo, you know, I mean, the waters I had to navigate for on a daily basis versus, you know, the, Smart, small amount of time that I had interacting with them as a freelancer, but then vice versa. It's like it's a lonely, it's very lonely, you know, it's a lonely position. It's very difficult, you know. 
and the idea that like you would say no to stuff is it's tough like it really is hard to get to a point where you're saying no to things you know and i would say i mean i left dc in 2015 so now i'm coming up it still feels very recent to me but like i'm coming up on 10 years now of like being out of you know on my own and it's it's really only been recently that i've you know actively like had to turn stuff down i mean i've turned things down that just like they, they couldn't pay me or there was nothing you know whatever but like to, to turn stuff down that i would really want to work on or that you know that, that i've just had to say no to just from really from a time kind of bandwidth standpoint yeah. um yeah it's, it's really been recently within maybe the last year and you know and even that might be pushing it it's just it's hard you know like i totally get it why all these freelancers end up over committing or saying yes because you just never know because you just get this this fear that they're going to stop calling you right so yeah um but then you know it, but it's odd because in terms of human nature there's a lot of power in saying no right there's a lot of there's a lot of you know it's a difference between veronica and betty right you know i mean veronica treats archie like crap and he keeps coming back for more and betty's always there you know to help him and you know and he neglects her you know like it's i mean it's i don't know it's just human nature but so yeah I, but it's tough in the moment to just be like yeah i don't think i want to do that you know because i know i'm gonna need more time you know but yeah i i definitely i feel like there were i have hit points where i'm over committed and i'm not living up to my own standards even you know it's a bit like running like a restaurant like i feel like as long as the people out front like don't really notice it then yeah you know that's ultimately okay yeah, but I notice it internally, and I feel you know it makes me feel bad that like there's definitely been times when I feel like I'm just I'm not phoning it in, but there's definitely you know where I'm just feel like I'm not giving it the attention it deserves probably. And even if you don't see it as a reader, or even if as a creator you don't see it, like it's my own internal clock. Like and and you you know it like you can sort of yes. smell it when you know when that's the thing. So yeah, it, it is. Um, it is a challenge to try to figure out, you know, how to do that. But again, it's like, yeah, even the business of like, oh, I wish I could manage talent. Like, I, you know, I wish I had a manager sometimes too, you know? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's funny just to hear you talk about the, about comics and, and in so many parallels with the music industry, you know, um, even that statement, just talking about like, if the reader doesn't know yeah, that, that is, that is music in a nutshell, because it's always a fiasco every single day. But as long as the 40,000 people on the other side don't really notice it, then your job is a success. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. And I think, I think the danger is just getting to the point where you stop that sort of self analysis, you know, like, I mean, yeah. I think it's like you do the show and it's like, you just feel like, eh, like they'll eat whatever you put out for them. You know, I think that's, I think that's where the danger starts to come in. Right. You know, I think that's where the lack of quality or when you see it in bands that just kind of, like they're just phoning it in, you know, it's like, you just get to the point where it's like, eh, you know, what's the difference, you know, like they're, they're happy. They didn't notice that like we messed up that stuff or we didn't play that song or, you know, what was the worst rendition of that tune ever, you know? So I think, but I think you have to constantly be trying to, you know, fight against that because it's too easy to just say, okay, sure. You know, like they'll buy it. What's the difference? You know, like we know, People like jock stuff. It looks great. Like they'll buy it. Just get it out there, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's the thing that you're constantly fighting against. That's the casino circuit and music, by the way, that, that is always mm -hmm. the marker, right? It's smash mouth or somebody else doing casino circuits. Don't ever get on those tours. That is the worst experience you could possibly. Yeah. Have. I mean, I feel like even these residencies and stuff, you know, it's just like, I, you know, some of the people I know have seen like even the U2 stuff have just been like, yeah it's okay you know like it's just you know but it's like you just get the sense of you know they're the, even the same in between every song patter is the same you know it's not like there's nothing kind of you know improvise improvisational about it or in that moment or that particular show it's like they're really just kind of painting by numbers you know yeah yeah and it's like i don't i don't want a residency at a las vegas casino you know where i can just do the same album like every <laughs> Well, I mean, so and it's interesting because you would think that's the kind of case like it's not always the case because 
I, even this is really in the weeds, but like a few years ago, they released that Elvis, like all those recordings of Elvis in Las Vegas. And he right. was literally doing two shows a night, you know, of like the same material, like a dinner show and then like a midnight show. And the amount of like differences in the versions and the amount of differences in the pattern with the audience and like just the, the energy levels and stuff like in between not just daily shows, but two shows a day. Like yeah. it, it's really like, it, it was amazing. Like at a certain point, like you listen to the same song, like 10 times, like you pick a song, you listen to them. And it, it's incredible to think that like, you know, as someone like an Elvis, I think people would probably, you know, assume he's just kind of going through the motions or whatever, but like the, the dude must've really been like, pretty driven because there's you you hear so many differences and just the presentation and his energy levels and the, the sort of you know in the moment comments and pitter patter with like the audience or with the singers and stuff yeah it's kind of interesting like that sort of stuff there's a little in the weeds but no i actually want to ask you about like a, a, a unique kind of project because i was talking to rum about a week ago about the one hand and six figure six fingers Ugh. Um, uh -huh which I thought was one heck of an ambitious idea. So kind of what appealed to you about wanting to buy into that one? Um, yeah, I mean, I never, <clears throat> it is ambitious. And it, and it was like, I. it's one of those things that when you hear the idea, you're like, how come there hasn't been more of this? You know, I, I don't want to say like it's never happened before. Maybe it's happened before. If it has, I'm not exactly sure where, you know, what I, what I would point to per se, but um yeah, it was just the idea of that sort of thing. Like, it's just such an interesting thing. And, and, and just the challenge of working on two projects that are related, but also have to stand on their own, you know, um, is, has definitely been like a challenge, you know, I mean, because at first, I was kind of like, well, you know, you, I mean, some of it is just literally continuity kind of stuff that you need to kind of keep track of. Yeah. Um, but then some of it is just more kind of tonally or directionally and that sort of thing. Um, and then it's even just the moving parts of like getting the books to come out in a certain sequence and all the rest, you know? Um, yeah. And we even had big conversations recently about the collection. Like I hadn't really put a lot of thought into how it was being collected. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we're trying, you know, there's, there's a lot of back and forth discussion about, you know, what's the best way to collect them for the reading experience, but also from a sales standpoint and all the rest, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty ambitious and we, I mean, thankfully we've had a pretty long runway for it. So, um, it's not the kind of thing that I would want to be doing on like really short notice, you know I mean? We've been working on it for a couple of years now, I, I would say, you know, with yeah. like a lot of the issues in the can and everything. Um, but you know, they're, it's smart. I mean, Ram is like really, I mean, he's one of the smartest, I mean, you know, people in the industry in terms of just managing his managing his stuff and managing his career and the decisions he's made and things like that. And, um, and beyond just being super creative. Um, and you know, he's got a little bit of a team of, you know, the people who work with him on other books and stuff. So there's a coherent vibe to the two projects, you know, even though they're sort of, you know, you could read either one on its own and get like a really hopefully satisfying experience. Well, this is my totally random question, so you'll have to forgive me here before we wrap up. Um, <laughs> okay. In my former life, I was a, a professional uh, landscape photographer. Um, that's before okay. Lupus permanently shut the door for that. Um, spent a lot of time in the Finger Lakes region, like teaching photography workshops, and, and my son has his sights actually set on Cornell. So in an area known for its waterfalls and as kind of a native yourself, what's your, what's your favorite spot to get outside in the Finger Lakes region? Oh, it's good. That's a good one. Cause I, yeah, I worked all my teenage years in the, in the New York state, uh, parks, you know, up there. Like I didn't you know, know, I grew, you know? yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I grew up in Ithaca, so I grew up in, you know, so yeah, I worked at Treeman. I worked at Buttermilk. These are like all the parks around Ithaca. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I spent a lot of time, you know, outdoors. I mean, in that area, I mean, it's tricky. Like there's the biggies, like Watkins Glen is kind of the big, you know, like you, you want the real, you want the big bombastic, like Vegas kind of experience. And, you know, Watkins Glen is like really like probably the one that most people point to, but yeah, yeah. there's some really, really smaller ones. Like the Treeman has like a swimming hole where there's the, 
waterfall that you can climb behind on the the rocks, you know, which is a nice little touch. And then um, there's a trail in Upper Buttermilk Falls that's like just that was a kind of my personal favorite. My wife and I, when we first were married, living there, had a dog. Like that was the one. You know, it's a lot of steps, and I don't know nowadays. I mean, I was a much younger man then, but like you know, <laughs> it's um, it's you know the the the, the, the trail that takes you from like lower buttermilk to upper buttermilk is just you know it's pool after pool of like this just crystal clear like cold water and you know you're not supposed to swim in it but of course everybody does sure but yeah i grew up my entire life like you know young life swimming in all the gorges and you know all the crazy stuff like we used to have those like you try to swim as early in the season as you can so you go to like ithaca falls or other places and jump in and like you know the sort of polar bear club and that kind of stuff but um yeah i mean it's a i mean it's like one of the most beautiful places i've i mean i've been fortunate to travel all over but it's you know anytime i'm back up there i'm always just like oh this is incredible up here like the hills and the vineyards and you know all the things but you know, yeah it's a, a few. it's amazing pocket of i mean I, I just love love the area um my one fun story was uh, driving one by one night and there was a, you know, white deer right behind the fence. And, and, and mm-hmm. it was just like ethereal and spooky. And that was before I knew about the the white deer population that's there on the armory. Um, mm-hmm. So right. that, that freaked my shit. That was wild. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is pretty, that is pretty crazy. But um, yeah, you know, it's, it is, it is just amazing country up there. That's for sure. No, so but yeah I, I spent a lot of time as a kid and then working in all those parks like you know like as a teenager it's that's great. really cool yeah i was well, lucky anything that it's new that's dropping that you're personally working on you you want to give a little pitch to before we go <clears throat> um yeah i mean we're trying to wrap up the first couple of distillery series like gone like gone three and somna three like you know um putting those to bed. So those first couple series are, you know, wrapped up, which is great. I mean, you mentioned the one hand and the six fingers. I think six fingers, number one just came out today. Right. Um, yeah. This I week. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. I mean, if people want to look into that, I mean, it's just, th- those books are great. You know, Dan Waters wrote that one and, um, you know, working with Ram on the other one. Um, yeah. And then I think we've already announced like some of the next books in the, in the distillery wave, you know, there's the Scott Snyder white boat, with Francesco Francavia, you know, worked from Batman and did Night of the Ghoul with me together. And and then of course the the Blood Brothers Mother, which is the Western that Azarello and Riso or Eduardo Riso are doing, which just looks incredible. Like Brian and I yesterday you went over the first issue, like all the corrections on the first issue, the lettering and just like every page we were just marveling at like, you know, that like what a master like Eduardo is at comic book storytelling, you know. Like yeah. the choices he makes and the things that he puts in and the things that he leaves out like it's just it's just every page is like a master class you know um so yeah and it's still it's good that you know we both of us the two of us were like this is just awesome like these pages are just so good you know and that you can work with people you work with for 25 years and still see them pushing themselves to that le- you know to, to, to do it at such a high level I and mean, yeah. that, that is definitely um you know, makes me, you know, get out of bed in the morning, <laughs> you know, like for sure. I feel very fortunate in that respect. Well, where can people find you online? Do you even want them to find you online <laughs> these these <laughs> days, know. right? Do they want me to find, do they want to find me online? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I have a, I do have a website that's mostly just, you know, kind of, yeah, uh, like stuff I've worked on and things. Um, Bespokecomics.com, which is, you know, a little bit like, cheeky cheekily named but um yeah and i'm on instagram it's like really od on instagram if you want to see but mostly it's just me my other big hang up and my other big obsession is like always been like warhammer you know games workshop stuff yeah um so uh that's like my hidden my secret shame so really my instagram is mostly <laughs> it's mostly warhammer. mostly posts of me like you know yeah like you know models that i've painted poorly um you know that sort of stuff so um but yeah that's the only one i'm on i'm not on i quit twitter years ago i i don't good for you on facebook and you know yeah yeah that was the best decision i ever made i can't recommend it more highly um 
but yeah, so Instagram's only one. I, I don't know, Instagram's okay. It seems like people are generally a little nicer, it feels like, and it doesn't feel quite as like toxic as those other ones felt, you know? Yeah. But I try to limit the time as much as I can. No one wants to hear from this like old dude about, you know, painting his 28 millimeter space marine. <laughs> Good on you. I don't, so, <clears throat> I'm, I'm almost 49, almost 50. I can't imagine like my eyes for hours sitting there with the brush and pulling that oh, off these days. Oh, I know. Believe me. Yeah, no, I know. I can't imagine either, but yeah, you just get like some magnifying glasses or whatever. Like that's about <laughs> all I can do. And they're done to what you'd call like a table ready st- standard, not a, you know. Yeah. You're not going to put them in anybody's case or put them up for a painting contest, but it is, I don't know. It's fun. It's definitely, I love all the, the lore and just the world of it and everything. And the community is a little toxic at times. I don't really deal with a lot of the, you know, stuff. It's really just more of the hobby side of it, but it is, it is kind of fun, particularly living in the Northeast, you know, like it's like 15 degrees out now. So yeah, you know, like last night, I definitely was like, yeah, I could just sit up here and putter around for an hour or two, listen to a podcast like yours and, you know, it's all good. It's relaxing. <laughs> Something different, you know. And it's not still- looking at a screen too. That's a big part of it for me. Is that you know, yeah, it doesn't involve screens, which I appreciate. Yeah, I can't do screens at night at all. I can't sleep afterwards. I'm, I no, feel like no, such an I old can, man. I can barely sleep. I've never slept like ever. Like even since I, 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 I can't sleep, but my sleep habits are terrible. And I know everyone else sleep. You got to get sleep, whatever. But like they've always been terrible. So. I don't worry about it so much. Like it isn't like a recent development that I would run to a doctor and say, it's just been like this since I was like a teenager, younger, you know, yeah. even when I was a little kid, my parents used to let me stay up like after they went to bed, you know, like just whatever, but it's just the way it is. But so, yeah, but yeah, it's fun. You know, you got, I think everyone should have hobbies, you know? Yeah. Is there, are there, are, are there still games workshop shops? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. There's some, okay, um, okay. Still one in New York. I mean, in the city, it's on Eighth Street. Been there forever, and I'm up in Connecticut now, but um, like maybe 90 miles from the city or something. But yeah, there's one over here in like Hart in West Hartford that you can go to. It's like maybe an hour and change. But um, so yeah, any excuse I can find. Yeah, even this weekend, I think we're taking a little trip like to the Berkshires for like a vacation. You know, like a little like just a weekend thing. And I'm yeah, I'm always, <laughs> I'm always looking at the google maps and like searching out you know abbey shops in the area and stuff like that luckily they mostly tend to turn out to be like you know rv car hobby shop so i don't you know i don't have to go to them or drag my wife to them but um yeah they're still they're still you know anytime i go to um thought bubble like in the uk which is a fantastic convention yeah you know the best conventions you can go to but like the method to my madness is that in in the uk like and there's a games workshop on every corner, you know? Right. And it's like, it's such a bigger part of the culture there that, yeah, you can visit all these different ones. And so, yeah, that's always a big part of my, any trip I take over there. So Pl- planning nerd, around little, little nerd action. Yeah, exactly. Go a day early and hit like two or three of them, you know? That's good. So, we all got to have our things. Yeah, no, exactly. You got to have something. And it's tricky. I, you know, I grew up loving comics, reading comics, and it's, it's the one big, downside to my whole career has been you know when one of your passions like turns into your job you know it's it's definitely like a minefield you know i mean people yeah. always think i think people think it's like oh i want to turn my passion into a job and it's it's cool but it's also like it's a double-edged sword you know for yeah, sure probably so. probably know better than most like that was yeah the music industry like it. And it, it bit me and I did it, you know, for 15 years and, you know, I was in my mid twenties and I saw the writing on the wall, like all my friends who were 40 and it, mm-hmm. it's, it's just a, it's just rough, um, on yeah. the body. Yeah. So I was like, I need an out. So dropped oh, out. Yeah, of that. That. yeah. Yeah. Dropped out I of music imagine. back, double major anthropology and environmental science and the rest is history. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, all sounds right. Good. If you're happy, that's all that matters. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, happiness is one of those things you have to go, you have to go find happiness. Like, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. No, everybody, yeah, no doubt. yeah. All right. Well, well, thanks for joining me today on the show. Uh, best of luck with yeah, distillery and future endeavors. 
Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time for the invitation. It's nice of you. Yeah. Well, this all right, is Byron. Cool. O- yeah, this is Byron O'Neill on behalf of all of us at Comic Book Yeti. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. This is Byron O'Neill, one of your hosts of the Cryptid Creator Corner, brought to you by Comic Book Yeti. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Please rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It lets us know how we're doing, and more importantly, how we can improve. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cryptid Creator Corner, maybe you would enjoy our sister podcast, Into the Comics Cave. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.